Florida's wide-ranging investigation into potential election uh, collusion and uh, meddling. And that could include testifying against Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort. Now, Gates revealed in a letter to family and friends that he had a, quote, change of heart. And he just wouldn't be fighting the charges against him anymore. Last hour, I spoke to Democratic Congressman John Garamendi uh, and asked him what he thinks this plea deal means for the larger picture, the Russia probe. I'm, I'm very, very pleased the Mueller investigation is moving along. I'm pleased that, at least for the moment, Congress is not uh, trying to derail it. This investigation is getting awfully close to the Oval Office. Uh, this man, uh, Gates, well, Mo uh, first of all, Manafort was the campaign manager, then Gates was the deputy and stayed on throughout the campaign through the, uh, uh, right on into uh, the new presidency. And so, uh, there's a very serious problem here, at least amongst those two and the people they are associated with. We're talking about very close connections to the Russians. All right, let's discuss now with Ron Brownstein, CNN political, a senior political analyst and senior editor for The Atlantic. Ron, good morning. Good morning. Okay, so let's start here with the framing from Congressman Garamende that this right. is getting closer to the campaign, closer to the president. What is the significance as it relates to the question of potential collusion between the campaign and Russia? Right. I mean, the, the first point is that the charges still are not directly associated with the campaign, but it, it goes with what we have seen from the special counsel from the beginning. First of all, uh, we have learned over and over that the special counsel, Robert Mueller, can keep a secret. In an era of pervasive media, media uh, he constantly surprises us, and I think we have very um, uh, uh, sober about acknowledging we don't know what he knows. But, but clearly, uh, the second point is that he is very organized and methodical, and he, is work, he works from the outside in. And uh, I think you have to look at this, uh, first the indictment, and then the, the plea deal from, from Rick Gates as an effort to put pressure uh, on Paul Manafort, who, has, uh, as you pointed out, was the campaign chairman, basically the campaign manager for a critical period of the campaign, who now faces some very stark choices about whether or not to cooperate himself with this investigation. I want to point out that Manafort did release a statement uh, saying he continues to maintain his innocence. He said, I'd hoped and expected my business colleague would have had the strength to continue the battle to prove our innocence for reasons yet to surface. He chose to do otherwise. Do you get the mm -hmm. sense that Manafort knows what those reasons yet to surface are? Or, I, you know, I Right. I mean, that, that is, you know, that's the kind of statement you would put out if you intend to continue fighting the charges. But I think, uh, you know, all legal analysts uh, would now agree that he is in a very perilous position, given how intimately involved uh, Mr. Gates was in the same activities that the special counsel is alleging against him. Uh, and, uh, you know, and there's also the question beyond what Rick Gates can mean in terms of pressuring Paul Manafort, there is his own interaction in the campaign. And, and you know, as you pointed out, he remained on after Paul Manafort left. During the transition, uh, he was part of a group that was supporting uh, the president. So we don't know, again, uh, the, the, the great caution here is that we don't know what the special counsel knows, uh, except the lesson is that he knows a lot that we don't. Um, so we, 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 it, there's no, we, we simply don't know whether Rick Gates has information other than what can put pressure on Paul Manafort, but at the least, we know that he can do that. For months, Ron, there was nothing from the yes. uh, special counsel. We didn't see any indictments. We knew that the work was continuing. Occasionally, there would be a report of, of someone close to the campaign having to testify before uh, Mueller or, or grand jury. And now there's this quickening of indictments mm -hmm. and, and pleas. What do you make of that? Well, first, as I said, I think he is extraordinarily methodical, and we are seeing kind of a classic investigation that works from the outside in, that puts pressure on figures at the periphery, to put pressure on more central figures, to put pressure on figures at the absolute core of the question. At the least, Victor, I think what has happened in the last couple weeks is that he has defanged, I think, those Republicans in Congress who are trying to undermine the investigation, and he has made it extremely difficult for the, the administration to have any kind of plausible conversation about firing him. 
him. I mean, particularly the, 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 the indictment of those Russian actors uh, made it clear that he is dealing with something of great seriousness uh, that is of national security import. Uh, and I think at, at the least, what has happened in the past few weeks uh, is he, I think, has made it politically impossible. for the administration or the Republicans in Congress. Uh, of the kind that was being discussed a few weeks ago. Yeah, a new spate of charges and a guilty plea in a matter of hours. Yes. Uh, of one yes. Another. Ron Brownstein, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. So new this morning, uh, as everyone still tries to absorb what happened at that high school in Florida, we're learning that Delta is the latest company to cut ties with the NRA. Uh, will more big businesses follow suit, and what impact does it have on that group? Plus, new reporting from the White House that uh, the White House knew weeks ago that the Jared Kushner, uh, well, Jared Kushner rather, faced significant issues getting security clearance. So what could happen now to his job in the West Wing? They will take away those massive tax cuts, and they will take away your Second Amendment. By the way, if you only had a choice of one, what would you rather have, the Second Amendment or the tax cuts? Go ahead. Second Amendment, tax cuts. Second Amendment. I'm going to leave it at the Second Amendment. I don't want to get into that battle, all right? We're going to say you want, Matt, we're going to say you want the Second Amendment the most. But repealing the Second Amendment, part of the Bill of Rights laid out by the founders, is not easy. Here's a reminder. It takes support from two-thirds of the House and Senate. It needs approval from three-quarters of, of the states. And uh, we can add one more there. Is not going to happen. Um, now, let's talk about the, the NRA. It wasn't always this way. Um, the Supreme Court only clarified rather gun rights uh, interpretation of the Second Amendment 10 years ago in the landmark D.C. Heller uh, uh, case. Uh, NRA once promoted gun safety laws. Uh, now the NRA is seen as a power in politics. But that does not mean they're widely popular. This CBS poll shows 46 percent think that the NRA has too much influence on politics today. Let me bring in now Adam Winkler, law professor at UCLA. He's the author of Gunfight, the Battle Over the Right to Bear Arms. UCLA. He's the author of Gunfight, the Battle Over the Right to Bear Arms. This morning, I will be strongly pushing comprehensive background checks with an emphasis on mental health, raise age to 21, and end sale of bump stocks. Congress is in a mood to finally do something on this issue, I hope. I want you to listen to uh, Senate Majority Whip John Cornyn on one element of that plan. I think what we ought to focus on is things that will actually save lives. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I think the folks should be on the Fix Nix bill, which is the only bipartisan piece of legislation that can be signed into law. There's a lot of other ideas out there that people are proposing that I don't think will actually change any outcome. Um, and so I prefer to focus on things that will actually save lives and will affect outcomes. One of the elements he highlighted is uh, raising the, the gun purchase age for all weapons to 21. What, describe for us the fight the president has ahead with his own party if he's going to push these elements uh, that he tweeted out this morning. Victor, there's going to be a, a, a substantial debate on this, but I think debate is helpful. No matter where you come from on this, and there'll be some ideas that will be shot. on this, but I think debate is helpful. No matter where you come from on this, and there'll be some ideas that will be shot.
down to reduce what has become just absolutely deplorable. All of us agree something's got to be done. What to be done is the big question, but I like to see folks from all different backgrounds come together and say, well, what about this? What about this? I served in the legislature in both yeah. bodies at one time as a young man, and, and I went into a debate sometimes thinking one thing, but after careful consideration and a good plan laid out by a different opposing view, sometimes they change my mind, and that's what's healthy most for the process. All right, Adam, let me come to you. In your book, uh, Gunfight, you write about the NRA meeting that changed everything because the group wasn't always what people see today. That's right. The NRA was formed in the 1870s after the Civil War, and for most of its history, it supported reasonable gun control laws in the 1920s and 30s, for instance, supporting laws restricting concealed carry of firearms, laws that today's NRA challenges in court as a violation of the Second Amendment. Uh, the NRA in 1977 uh, had a revolt at the membership meeting where a group of hardliners took over uh, and ousted the existing leadership that was favorable towards at least moderate gun control measures. Uh, and the NRA really devoted itself since 1977 to a hard-hitting political agenda of opposing any gun control laws. So, Adam, a Delta... speech at CPAC the other day seemed to be uh, more about digging in than about finding places to compromise. But I will say we are seeing uh, just a wave of private businesses express their unhappiness with the NRA by cutting their ties. And it shows that even though nothing's happening through legislation right now, the private market is stepping up to really make a stand against the NRA. Andre, I want you to listen to President Trump. This was April at the uh, annual NRA meeting, April of 2017. Here's what he said. You have a true friend and champion in the White House. No longer will federal agencies be coming after law-abiding gun owners. No longer will the government be trying to undermine your rights and your freedoms as Americans. Andre, if a Democrat had proposed what the president is proposing now as it relates to background checks and bump stocks and the age to purchase a weapon, it would likely be received as federal agencies coming after law-abiding gun owners and, and undermining rights and freedoms. So why are we hearing rejection of the policies but not the vitriol that has been reserved for Democratic lawmakers uh, on these topics? and freedom. So why are we hearing rejection of the policies but not the vitriol that has been reserved for Democratic lawmakers uh, on these topics? Issue. I think he is evolving, saying, look, we've got to address a situation that has now come to our attention. And as a leader, I think that's a good quality. I don't always agree with the president, but I do appreciate that he is trying to make an effort to say, hey, we got a problem here. There were several different people at fault here, but what can we do to come together to throw some suggestions out there and find some solution to a problem? Uh, Adam, to you, what we're not hearing, we heard from, from Wayne LaPierre calling, uh, saying that Chris Murphy and, and leader uh, Pelosi hate individual freedoms based on their call for stronger uh, background checks and, and stricter gun controls and, and criticizing the NRA. We're not hearing anything about the president do you expect that they will stay pretty quiet uh, about this president as he continues to, to push these policy changes? Well, I think one of the real keys is what are the policy changes that the president's really going to propose? So he proposed a ban on bump stocks, but that was a deal that was reached two months ago in Congress uh, when a piece of proposed legislation was shelved in favor of ATF reconsideration. So that's not a new policy change, and it's something that the NRA supported. Um, uh, things like the fix. Bill. It's a very marginal fix that provides some additional incentives for states to uh, help out the background check system. It's a good reform, but it's just not
bringing the number of people who support those universal background checks almost universally here. You've got 97% of respondents who support it, and the 3% here is in the margin of error. So it could essentially be everybody. Uh, Adam Winkler, Andre Bauer, thank you both. Many blessings. Have a great weekend. You too. President Trump says that Jared Kushner's security clearance is in the hands of his chief of staff, John Kelly. But amid these reports of bitter relationships between Kelly and Kushner, will the president's son-in-law keep his role in the West Wing? Also, a strong message coming from the White House after the president imposes the strongest sanctions yet on North Korea. We have a live update for you from Pyeongchang. Stay close. you know, complicated financials. They don't have that, and it's still taking months. It's a broken system, and it shouldn't take this long. You know how, how many people are on that list? People with not a problem in the world. The deadline for stripping officials of their interim clearances, by the way, was yesterday. Not clear if any action has actually been taken on that. But Samantha Vinograd with us now. She's a CNN national security analyst and also served on the National Security Council under President Obama. And Michael Zeldin, CNN legal analyst, and uh, he also was Robert Mueller's former special assistant at the DOG. Thank Jay, excuse me. Thank you both so much for being here. Um, Samantha, to you first. President Trump, obviously, he could grant any clearances to Kushner. Uh, the president's advisors have determined eh, that would be a pretty drastic step. Do you think it could come to that? I think that it could when we looked at when we look at the pattern of selective hearing that President Trump has had since his campaign and since he's come into office. He should definitely listen to General Kelly, but he should also listen to his intelligence community. There is zero ambiguity here. The intelligence community in a Senate briefing said publicly that anybody with an interim clearance should lose access to sensitive intelligence. For a reason, Jared Kushner has gotten a hall pass on basic counterintelligence. For a reason, Jared Kushner has gotten a hall pass on basic counterintelligence. Well, two questions there. With mm -hmm. respect to the should he have his clearance, what, uh, what Sam says is absolutely right, but in addition, I would add that the FBI has told the White House that there are substantial law enforcement issues that they are investigating and that they cannot proceed uh, to give him a clearance until they resolve those things. So these are not, as the president seemed to indicate, just complex financial dealings of a very wealthy man, but these are concerns that the FBI in their background uh, in inquiry have with respect to uh, Kushner. So because of that, I think it's hard to justify him retaining that clearance, uh, especially when it looks at the most serious level of classified documentation. So, Michael, what might some of those red flags be that they're looking at? Well, I think could, that, Michael, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, well, uh, and then Sam knows way better than I do, but the, the issues are whether he's subject to compromise or blackmail or some other level of interference that would make him susceptible to foreign
about a counterintelligence risk, which, as Michael raises, could be undisclosed foreign meetings, conflicts of interest related to business transactions, gambling debt, name your bribery target. But again, Jared Kushner, I think, like Rob Porter, is getting special treatment and just having this interim renewed over and over again. So, Sam, let me ask you this. Uh, General Kelly made it known that President Trump's personal intervention would be problematic let's say, if he essentially tried to drive this train. If the president did try to exert some authority here, help us understand what's at risk. Is it the relationships in the West Wing? Is it with the intel community? Is it amongst the top uh, aides to the president? I think there's definitely going to be an impact and probably already has been an impact on our foreign intelligence relationships. If you're a foreign country and you're used to sharing intelligence,